All right, let's talk about fan remasters. All right, fan remasters. Now, uh, what exactly is a fan remaster? Basically, you know, you could argue over the terminology of whether or not you should use the term remaster, whether or not that's proper, uh, but it doesn't matter. It's ultimately, you're just trying to make the track better, sound better, you know? The production quality better, not like changing the the song structure or something crazy like that, but uh, that's ultimately what you're trying to do. Now, you run into a few issues when you try to do that as a fan because you do not have access to the individual splits, right? The, the tracks, the stems, as they call it. Um, and so that makes it pretty difficult to, uh, well, actually, it limits the amount of tools that you have at your disposal now. You can't just go in and say, okay, well, the bass is non-existent. The bass guitar doesn't exist in this track. Let's raise it. Well, you can't do that anymore. Now, uh, you're limited to a single file, which means you're limited to an equalizer and a limiter. At least that's how I saw it when I did most of these remasters back in the day. That's all I used for 90%. And maybe there's a little something else uh, occasionally sprinkled in there, but that's 99% of the whole process was using a equalizer and a limiter when, you know, things got uh, too quiet or things got too loud, right? Because if you're using equalizer, you're increasing the volume of certain frequencies, resulting in a louder signal. So you need to use the limiter, of course, also at the end to make the volume consistent. Over here, I have Audacity open. Now, you may be asking, why, Shreddy, why on earth is Audacity open, right? Don't you have money? to buy a good enough DAW, and you're right, I do, I do have Reaper, okay? Whether or not Reaper's a good a DAW, you know, that's that's uh, debatable, but I'm not using that because this is what I used back in the day, and you know, even though, you know, with the experience I've gained since then, experience I've gained, like I'm, like I'm some producer or something, Audacity still has specific tools that I haven't really found other places, and what I'm talking about is this, okay? What I would do is I would go in and I would split the verse of a track just so it's easier to select and it's consistent you can consistently select that area and then i would use the spectrum analysis tool this guy and there are other plugins like you know tdr nova and other well i mean it's the breadth of plugins that have a, a spectrum analyzer the reason why audacity is a special is because i haven't found any other one that just takes a snapshot of an area, right? Because usually it's when the track is playing and it's something like this, right? There's not a lot of detail. Now that's a problem though, because if you want to see all the individual frequencies, if you want to see why a track is fucked up, you're going to need all the detail you can get. And so that's why Audacity kind of has that. Um, also, the equalizer that comes with Audacity, it's a 30 band equalizer. And then we were saying, okay, well, yeah, 30 bands, whatever. You can just use a parametric equalizer and just get an infinite number of bands. And that's correct. But you know, there's a thing called option paralysis. You have so many options with a parametric equalizer, literally everything on the frequency spectrum that it can be a bit paralyzing, right? So 30 bands is, is still a lot of bands, but at least you have something anchoring you, right? Uh, so I would just use that. I'm in high school at the time, right? Like 2016, 2017. So of course, you know, I kind of had to use it, but. And so here I have Savage, right? The first track off of Cacophony's uh, 1987 album, Speed Metal Symphony, fantastic record but bogged down by production quality, a particularly fucked up EQ where the guitars, the mids of the guitars are ridiculously high. And uh, I'll play a bit for you right here. Um clacky sounding snare there's not a lot of high end there's not a lot of high end with the cymbal so they sound kind of muted the kick is not that bad for some of the other albums around that period and some of the other records that i've taken a look at but uh, there's still some improvement in the kit that can be made there so why is the frequency analyzer so important and it's because wow i can hear there's a lot of mids in this track well let's take a look at it right and you take a look at it and you go what the fuck <laughs> There's so much mids. 
in comparison, if we got a good track, uh, Megadeth's Holy Wars, Holy Wars off of the original Rust in Peace Master uh, that came out in 1991 or 1990, sorry. This is what the frequency looks like for the verse. There's a defined peak area for where the bass is. And then you got the mids. I would say mids are like 250 to like 2000 Hertz. That's the mids area. It's very large, very important. You got the treb. And then you got the really high treble and you see how it kind of, you know, they're kind of the same level and then it descends as the treble gets higher and higher until it drops off. That's generally how it should look. Of course, you know, the problem with looking at this, just looking at a static spectrum is that it depends on the song, right? And that can change everything the way it looks. But generally, from my experience, it's that you tend to have a bass peak and then you have the mids on a shelf lower and then it kind of descends, kind of rolls off as you get towards the trip. If stuff's outside of that area, it could just be the song or, you know, in this case, shit's really fucked up, right? Like, what the fuck is this? So my remaster removed a lot of that and then made it in that pattern, just using an equalizer, not using anything else special, right? Just using an equalizer and a limiter and that resulted in that change. So that's a pretty big change in the EQ spectrum, right? I flattened out all these 2K to 3K to 4K frequencies, and I raised a lot of the uh, treble up here, right? Uh, some would call it air for the cymbals. Because of that, you got something that sounds more like this. As compared to this. Like there's a big difference, right? So something that I would do, I haven't done uh, for this video, but you, if you're trying to compare tracks, the uh, you know that you have applied, you know your equalization to, but the best thing to do is to match the volume between the two tracks. It's very important because your ear tends to prefer anything that's louder. If you're A being two tracks, it'll your ear will prefer whichever one is louder. It's best to make sure that your shit is uh, is good. Right, so you would take something like this, it's just a, a Nyquist plugin, and or you would have um, the loudness meter plugin for Reaper or whatever DAW you're using, doesn't really matter, and make sure it's exact so you can actually make a fair comparison. But that's really all I did, and I tend I developed the general areas where each instrument sits. I would say that you know, of course, 20 hertz and below, right? You can't really hear, but you can feel if you have a, a subwoofer. So I tend to like to roll that off. Early 90s and, and 80s records have this weird one hertz jump. I don't know why that's there. Maybe it's an issue with the actual frequency analyzer, but basically from 20 hertz to 100 hertz, you got your your low bass. That's where your kick drum sits. The, uh, of course, low end of the bass guitar and some of the toms, right? They sit kind of in this region, the real low end side of the toms. And then from 100 hertz to 250 hertz, you got your upper bass region that's where the bass guitar mostly sits some frequencies of the low end of the guitar uh most of the toms uh, but of course you know when it comes to percussion the frequency range of the percussion of one drum is all over the place especially the snare so these are not perfect rules these are just these are just classifications that made it easier for me to do the remaster uh, from 250 to 2000 that's your mid-range very important and if it's too high then it sounds like trash the meat of the guitars uh your vocals a majority of the track is just in this mid uh in the mids and if they're fucked up the whole track will sound fucked up uh then you get in your treble your low end treble is about 2000 to 8000 i would say is your your low treble uh, that's where like, you know, the high end of the guitar is the high end of, of the vocals are uh the attack of the snare um, and some of the attack for the like hi-hat and the cymbal, it starts to come out there, but it's not fully there, you know? From 8,000 to 20,000, you got your air, right? That's the high end of the cymbals, your hi-hat, your crash, your ride, your, your china, all of that shit sits up there. It's referred to as air because it kind of just lets the track breathe, whereas you don't have enough of it, it sounds like it's being suffocated, like there's a pillow over the speaker. So that's all I really used to guide me. Uh, EQ'd the living shit out of the track. Other than use, you know, your limiter, your EQ, and maybe a compressor, 
a spe specific like a like a, a tape analog tape emulation compressor or something like that but make it very subtle because you're playing it to the whole goddamn track so you have to be very 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 careful i just want to say though if you are going to undertake this please for the love of god do not and i repeat do not do stupid shit like this okay do not fucking brick wall the shit out of your tracks i just as a reference, just to see what it looked like, I dropped in Fear of Divinis by a Behemoth, right? That's what this track looks like, all right? What the fuck happened there? I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna make a whole video about the loudness war. But yeah, a majority of these remasters came down to, on a lot of these old records, you could just simply just do a boost, a shelf, uh, a high shelf at 6,000, and just increase 30 hertz, 40 hertz, 50 and 60 and just jack those up, that'll help a lot of old records out because they just neglected those frequencies for some reason. Like King Diamond's Them record that I did is mostly just that. Um, but a lot of times it just comes down to, you know, were the changes that I made actually great enough to warrant uploading a video, a whole video thing on it, where if it's just a few frequencies or, you know, if you, it feels like you've done a lot, but then you listen back to it and you AB the tracks and it's just not that big of a difference, you know, that that's when it's hard when it came to doing videos for this channel. But yeah, that's all I have to say about doing fan remasters, guys. I hope you uh, take that information and don't make anything that's shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. It's the very, very time consuming. I can tell you that much. Uh, in regards, if I'm going to be doing any more remasters, listen, I'm fully retired. Okay. Like I'm saying too much time. So anyways, that was all I had to say for this video. Um, I hope you guys, uh, drop a like and subscribe to the YouTube channel that helps me with the algorithm. All right. Thanks guys. Bye.